Hello, I'm Dr. Wainur Fazila. In this video, we will learn about the periodic table. Before we get to know the periodic table, let me tell you the difference between organic and inorganic compounds. Organic compounds are the results of the activity of living things. But over the time, organic compounds can be synthesized in the laboratory. For example, protein, fat, and benzene. Inorganic compounds do not come from living things, but rather from minerals or natural resources. For example, gold and silver occurring in minerals, while oxygen and carbon dioxide can be obtained from the natures. In this world, all the things in the world are made of incredibly tiny particles called atoms, and also there are 92 different kinds of them. Most things have more than one kind of atom in them, but this nugget of pure gold contains only gold atoms. So, we call it as an element. An element is a substance made of only one kind of atom. Zooming back out, we see that the gold atoms become a lump of gold again. If we zoom out from silver atoms, we would see a lump of silver instead. Because there are 92 kinds of atoms, there must be 92 elements too. One for each kind. You probably have already heard about some of them, like carbon, iron, and aluminium. But maybe not acetine or ytterbium. With so many elements, there is a lot of names to remember. Fortunately, there is a list showing all the elements. It starts with the element with the lightest atoms, hydrogen, and goes to the element with the heaviest atoms, uranium. This list is called the periodic table. How about grabbing your own copy now and check it as you watch the video? The lightest element, hydrogen, is at the top left-hand side of the table. Each element can be written with a shorthand using one or two letters call its symbol, which is capital H for hydrogen. Each element also has its own number showing its place in this list, called its atomic number. Hydrogen is the lightest element, so its atomic number is 1. Zooming into helium, at the top right, we can see that its symbol is HE, big H and little e to make it a bit different to hydrogens. And its atomic number is 2, being the second lightest element. The third lightest element is lithium, so it has an atomic number of 3. Where is lithium? It starts the next row. This row goes up to atomic number 10 before another row is started. How many rows are there? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. The periodic table has 7 horizontal rows, or also known as period. What about these rows down below, called the lanthanides and actinides? Well, they really belong to rows 6 and 7 and should slot into these spaces. The lanthanides are element 57 to 71 and the antinites are elements 89 to 103. To slot them in, we have to make the periodic table wider. This full table is more accurate and some versions are printed this way. 
layer also makes it easier to see how many elements are in each row. 2 in the first row, 8 in the second, 8 in the third, 18 in the fourth, 18 also in the fifth, 32 in the sixth, and 32 in the seventh. Altogether, there are 118 elements. How come? And they mean to be only 92 elements? With uranium being the last one? Yes, but clever scientists have made artificial elements in the lab. Like neptunium and plutonium, the elements next door that were made in 1940. These new elements make the upper list of elements a bit longer. Let's collect the periodic table back to its usual shape, which is more convenient for fitting onto the screen. You can see that the periodic table is also arranged in vertical columns, which scientists call groups. How many groups are there? 1, 2, 3, up until 18. 18 vertical groups. The key point about groups is that they contain elements that are similar to each other, like members of a family. For example, all of group 1 elements except hydrogen are soft, malleable metals that explode when you put them into water. Some groups even have family names. Group 1 elements are called the alkaline metals. Group 2 elements are the alkaline earth metals. 17 are the halogens and group 18 are the noble gases. Are you ready to read the periodic table? What is the name of the element with atomic number 30? You just have to scan around and find 30. Zinc. What is the atomic number of calcium? Now you've got to find calcium on the table. 20. Which row is sulfur in? The third row. Choose any element in the fifth row. There are a lot of possible answers for this. Could be strontium, tin, iodine. You choose. Which group is chlorine in? Group 17. Choose an element in group 15. Could be nitrogen or arsenic or any of the others. Your choice. But what if you were asked which element is in row 5 and group 2? There can only be one answer. Strontium. Each element has its own unique combination of row and group. Can you see the grey diagonal band that splits the periodic table into two parts? This divides the elements into metals on the left and non-metals on the right. These elements are called semi-metals or metalloids because they have properties that are in between metals and non-metals. Hydrogen is special in lots of ways. It's to the left of the diagonal but it's not a metal. Well, it can be. It's a gas. It looks like it's in group 1 as a member of alkali metals, but it can be because it's not a metal. The truth is, hydrogen doesn't belong to any group, and it's considered to be a group all by itself. Some predictables even put it on its own to show this. Just remember, hydrogen is special. In conclusion, the periodic table is a list of elements that can make all the substances in the universe. Summary We have learned on the definition of atoms and elements. Get acquainted with the periodic table, symbol of element, and atomic number. Identify elements in periodic table and their family names, such as alkaline metals, 
alkaline earth metals, halogen, and noble gases. And lastly, differentiate between rows or periods with the groups in the periodic table. Electronic configuration of elements According to the Bohr model, an atom consists of a central part called the nucleus. which contains positively charged protons and electrically neutral neutrons. The number of protons in an atom is called its atomic number and is represented by Z, while the sum of its protons and neutrons is called its mass number, which is represented by A. Besides protons and neutrons, there are negatively charged particles called electrons, which revolve around the nucleus in various shells or orbits. This arrangement of electrons around the nucleus of an atom in various orbits is called its electronic configuration. Please note here that the number of electrons in an atom is always equal to the number of protons, which makes the atom electrically neutral. Every orbit has a certain capacity to accommodate electrons. According to the Bohr-Bury rules, the maximum number of electrons that can be accommodated in a particular orbit is determined by the formula 2n squared, where n denotes the orbit number. For the first orbit, n is equal to 1. Therefore, 2n squared is equal to 2. Hence, the maximum number of electrons that can be accommodated in the first orbit is 2. Similarly, for the second orbit, n is equal to 2. 2n square equals 8. Hence, the maximum number of electrons that can be accommodated in the second orbit is 8. Although the third orbit can be occupied by a maximum number of 18 electrons, when 8 electrons are occupied in the third orbit, a certain degree of stability is given to the atom. Hence, the next electron, instead of entering the third orbit, goes into the fourth orbit. For example, the atomic number of potassium is 19. Therefore, there are 19 electrons revolving around the potassium nucleus in the potassium atom. Out of this, two electrons enter the first orbit, eight in the second orbit, the other eight enter the third orbit, and the remaining one electron. Instead of entering the third orbit, enters the fourth orbit. Hence, the electronic configuration of potassium is 2A81. The electronic configuration of an element also helps us to decide the position of an element in the periodic table. The number of orbits or shells denote the period to which the elements belong. Let's continue with the same example of potassium. Its electronic configuration is 2A81. This means there are four shells in an atom of potassium, and therefore it belongs to the fourth period of the modern periodic table. Similarly, sodium with three shells belongs to the third period. Lithium with two shells belongs to the second period. Rubidium with five shells is placed in the fifth period, and so on. The number of electrons present in the outermost or valence shell of an atom decides the group number of the element. Thus, potassium with one valent electron fits into group 1 of the modern periodic table. Magnesium with two valence electrons is placed in group 2. Aluminium with three valence electrons belong to group 13, and so on. However, there are a few irregularities shown by some elements in their configurations, such as that for chromium, copper, silver, gold, etc., which we will study in a separate topic. Despite these irregularities seen among the elements, it is possible to predict the position of most of the elements in the periodic table from their configuration and vice versa.
summary. We have seen that the number of protons present in the nucleus of an atom denotes its atomic number, while the sum of its protons and neutrons denotes its mass number. The atom is electrically neutral as it has the same number of electrons as protons. The number of orbits in an atom of an element tell us the period to which that element belongs while the number of valence electrons decides the group number of that element in the modern periodic table. Let's do some exercises of what we have learned so far. How to find the number of protons, electrons, and neutrons for nitrogen? To find the number of proton, electron, and neutron for nitrogen, we will complete the chart here using the periodic table for given nitrogen, we can look that up on the periodic table. We will find nitrogen is N, that's the element symbol for nitrogen. We can also see the atomic number, that's the number above the element symbol. Atomic number is 7 for nitrogen. Underneath the element symbol, here we have the atomic mass that is 14.01. Because periodic tables vary, remember the atomic mass is more massive, it's bigger than the atomic number and often it has decimal places. To find the number of protons for nitrogen, we need to know that the atomic number that equals the number of protons. So since we have an atomic number of 7, our number of protons is 7 in all nitrogen atoms. To find the number of electrons for nitrogen, we know that the number of protons will equal the number of electrons for a neutral element. So all the elements on the periodic table, those are neutral. Electrons equals protons. We have 7 protons, so we have 7 electrons for nitrogen. You can tell if an element is neutral because it will have nothing written after the element symbol. If it has something written, a plus or a minus after it in a superscript, that means it's an ion. It's not neutral, but we say on the periodic table, all the elements are neutral and the number of protons will equal to the number of electrons. To find the number of neutrons from nitrogen, we also need to find the mass number. So the mass number that equal protons plus neutrons. If you are not given the mass number, what you can do is take the atomic mass and round that to the whole number. So instead of 14.01, we will round that to 14 and that's our mass number. Now we know if we have 14 for our mass number and we know we have 7 protons. Then, the neutrons is going to equal something that will give us 14, 7 plus 7. So we have 7 neutrons for nitrogen. Let's wrap up with a bit of practice and then check your work. So pause and complete this table for oxygen. So there you have it. Now, let's learn about the shells and subshells of an element. According to Bohr's atomic model, there are fixed paths around the nucleus where electrons revolve. He called this path as shells or energy levels. Shells or energy levels are represented by small n. For example, this is first shell or energy level. So we write n is equal to 1 and so on. Also, remember that first shell is known as the K shell, followed by L, M and N shell. Secondly, every shell is divided into subshells or sub-energy levels. Subshells are denoted by S, P, D and F. So K, L, M and N are main shells, while S, P, D, F are subshells within main shells. The first K shell has only one subshell, S. The second L shell has two subshells, S and P. The third M shell has three subshells, S, P and D. While the fourth N shell has four subshells, S, P, D, F. The most easy trick to remember the subshell is, first shell has only one subshell, second shell has two subshells, third shell has three subshells, and fourth shell has four subshells. Next, when you go from the first shell to the fourth shell, 
at one subshell successively like S, then SP, then SPD, and then SPDF. Now I write N is equal to 1, and we know that it is K shell, and K shell has only one subshell, I mean S. Here I write 1 with this S because this S subshell belongs to the first K shell. Secondly, N is equal to 2. We know that it is L shell and there are two subshells in it, S and P. I write 2 with this S and with this P. Thirdly, I write N is equal to 3. It is M shell and we know that there are three subshells in it. S, P, and D. And I write 3 with S, P, and D because they belong to third shell. Fourthly, I write N is equal to 4. It is N shell and we know that it has 4 subshells S, P, D, and F. I write 4 with S, P, D, and F because they all belong to fourth shell. So if I write 3 S and 4 S, here, can you guess the difference between them? Well, 3 means third shell and S means subshell. So 3S means S is the subshell of the third main shell or M shell. Similarly, 4S means S is the subshell of fourth shell or N shell. Let's do the exercises. The first thing we need to do to find the electron configuration is to find the number of electron of the element. So we can find this using the predict table and we're going to look at the number above the element symbol which is called the atomic number. This will tell us the number of protons and also number of electrons. So we try one example with boron. You can see we have this chart here called electron configuration chart. We have boron with 5 electrons. So we follow the chart and we go down 1s. So we write 1s and we know that 1s holds up to 2 valent electrons. Let's put 2 electrons there. Then we have 2s flowing down there. That hold 2 electrons as well since it is an s orbital. And we already use 4 electrons while boron have only 5 electrons. As we go down the row here, we have 2p and 3s but we only need one more electrons to get five. We know that the P holds up to six, but we only need one. So that is the electron configuration for boron. 1s2, 2s2, 2p1. Notice that the number add up to five, just like the number of electrons for the element. Let's try another one, chlorine. So for chlorine, we have an atomic number of 17. 17 protons, but importantly for us is 17 electrons. So we go down, we have 1s that hold 2, we then have the 2s that hold 2s orbital, and then we go down 2p which hold up to 6 and we put 6 in there, and when we sum up, we use 10 electrons so far, and after 2p in that row, we have 3s which hold 2 and we use 12 electrons now, and then we go down this row here where we have the 3p and p holds up to 6 but since we have 12, we only need 5 more to get 17. That's the electron configuration for chlorine. According to Niels Bohr, electrons in an atom are arranged in a region around the nucleus called energy levels, orbits or shells. These orbits are represented by letters such as K, L, M, or by numbers 1, 2, 3, and so on. The number of electrons present in the outermost orbit are known as valent electrons, and the outermost orbit is called valence orbit. The maximum number of electrons that can be accommodated in the outermost orbit is 8. The elements with completely filled outermost orbit containing 8 electrons are said to possess an octet configuration. Such elements do not combine with other elements easily and hence show very little reactivity. Therefore, they are said to have zero combining capacity. 
On the other hand, the elements with incompletely filled valence orbits have a tendency to complete their octet configuration by combining with atoms of the same or different kind. This capacity of an atom to combine with another atom is called its valency. Elements combines with other elements by losing, gaining, or sharing their electrons. For example, electronic configuration of sodium is 2, 8, 1, and that of chlorine is 2, 8, 7. Sodium finds it easier to lose one electron rather than gaining seven electrons to complete its octet, while chlorine easily accepts an electron rather than losing seven electrons to complete its octet. Thus, both sodium and chlorine have a valency of one as their combining capacity is one. On the other hand, consider two chlorine atoms having electronic configuration two 7 approaching each other. As you can see, each chlorine atom needs one electron to complete its octet. In this case, instead of gaining or losing electrons, both the chlorine atoms share one electron each. Hence, the valency of both the chlorine atom in the chlorine molecule is 1, as their combining capacity is 1. Thus, the number of electrons gained lose or share complete the octet directly tell us about the combining capacity of the element that is its valency. Let us now calculate the valency of an atom. We will first study elements having more than four valence electrons. Consider an element of fluorine with atomic number 9 an electronic configuration of 2, 7. Fluorine thus has 7 valence electrons. In order to calculate its valency, the number of valence electrons are subtracted from it. Hence, the valency of fluorine is 1. For oxygen atom within an atomic number 8, then electronic configuration of 2, 6. Its valency is given by 8 minus 6, that is 2. Now, we will study those atoms which have less than 4 valence electrons. Consider an atom of sodium with an atomic number 11. It has an electronic configuration of 2, 8, 1. Thus, sodium has 1 valence electron. For such atoms, their valences are equal to the valence electron. Sodium thus shows a valency of 1. It should be noted that valency of both sodium and fluorine is 1, but sodium lose an electron while fluorine gain an electron in order to complete their octet. Hence, valency of sodium is considered to be positive, whereas that of fluorine is negative. Let us now see how the valency of ions is calculated. In case of ions, their valencies are the same as the charges carried by them and are expressed with proper signs. Species carrying positive or negative charge are called ions. Those which carry positive charges are known as cations. Some of the simple cations are Na+, Cu2+, Al3+, etc. And hence, they have valencies of plus 1, plus 2, plus 3, respectively. The species carrying negative charges are called anions. The example of anions are Cl-, O2-, etc. showing valencies of negative 1 and negative 2 respectively. Moreover, there exists a group of atoms carrying a charge known as polyatomic ion. For example, NH4+, SO4-2-, PO4 3 minus, etc. They show valences of plus 1, minus 2, and minus 3, respectively. 
That's all for the introduction of Predictable. Thanks for watching. See you in the next video. Bye-bye.